This video is sponsored by Established Titles. Have you seen this man? He might call himself Comte de Saint-Germain or the Count of Saint-Germain in English. Other names he used included Marquis de Montferrat, Chevalier Schooning, Count Weldon, and Prince Ricosi, the son of Francis Ricosi II of Transylvania. He was all of these people, and perhaps none, because the Count of Saint Germain never once revealed his true identity. The Count was one of the most well connected people across all of 18th century Europe. He was the best friend of the French king Louis XV, and also that of Prince Charles of Hesse Castle, which makes up a large part of modern day Germany. He brokered peace deals between nations, all while making the famous playboy Giacomo Casanova who many of his day called the world's greatest lover, seethed with envy of the Count's ways with women. Outside the bedroom though, as the Count claimed to be a celibate. Might I mention that all of these people confirmed his ability to speak nearly a dozen languages, including Chinese, many without accent. His seemingly photographic knowledge of every major historical event in Europe for the past thousand years and his vast accomplishments as a master violinist, composer, swordsman, painter, philosopher, and alchemist. That last one is particularly important, as you will soon see. I should also mention that he was laughably wealthy and gave away real diamonds and other precious jewels as gifts to the people he met. I'm not just making things up here, there's significant documentation on all of this, which we will be going into in detail. But the kicker is that the Count of Saint Germain claimed to be over 300 years old, and his death remains debated to this day. This is the tale of probably the most believable case of a real life immortal, if you're willing to consider it. Hey fellow seekers, welcome. I'm Mr. Mythos. If you're a fan of strange and ancient mysteries with research so deep you're guaranteed to fall down the rabbit hole, you're in the right place. I humbly ask that you give this video a like and ding the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the rare info we'll be digging into every video. And if you love it, please share it with a friend. But before we get into the count, if you think my name is actually Mr. Mythos, unfortunately that's not true. It's actually Lord Mythos, according to this certificate from today's sponsor, Established Titles. Seriously though, this genuine certificate signifies my ownership of one square foot of land on a private estate in Ardali, Aberdeenshire, Scotland. The plot number shows the exact location, and yes, that officially makes me a lord. Let me explain. Established Titles is a project based on a Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lords and ladies. By purchasing as little as one square foot, You'll receive this official title, and you can put it on your credit card, plane tickets, literally any document that allows prefixes like Mr. or Mrs. Seriously. And with your purchase, Established Titles plants a tree and supports global charities like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. In fact, their primary goal is to provide a fun way to preserve the woodlands of Scotland and beyond. So Established Titles is a great project to support, and it's got to be one of the best gifts. I mean, you can make your loved one a Lord or Lady of Scotland. Or bestow the title upon yourself, like me, Lord Mythos. Right now they're offering you all a special deal. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash MrMythos and use my code MrMythos for 10% off. Thanks again to Established Titles, let's jump right into the immortal mystery of the Count of Saint Germain. During his known lifetime, that is the one confirmed by historians, the Count of Saint Germain existed on this earth from at least 1743 to 1784. There has never been a verified date of birth, so 1743 marks the year of his first confirmed appearance. One day the Count showed up in London and impressed people with his music. Not long after he became the composer for the opera Lynn Constanza de Luzo which performed two years later to great success. No one knew where he came from and he wouldn't say, but his mastery of the violin spoke for itself. It was said that he played as if he was an entire orchestra. However, this was a tumultuous and paranoid period in Britain, as the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745 was underway. 
As we know, the Count of Saint Germain would not reveal his origin or identity. Thus, it's no surprise that he was soon arrested on suspicion of being a spy. The writer Horace Walpole recorded this in one of his famous letters. Quote, the other day they seized an odd man who goes by the name of Count Saint Germain. He has been here these two years and will not tell who he is or whence, but professes two wonderful things. The first, that he does not go by his right name, and the second, that he never had any dealings with any woman, nay, nor with any substitute. He sings, plays on the violin wonderfully, composes, is mad, and not very sensible. He is called an Italian, a Spaniard, a Pole, a somebody that married a great fortune in Mexico and ran away with her jewels to Constantinople, a priest, a fiddler, a vast nobleman. The Prince of Wales has had unsatiated curiosity about him, but in vain. However, nothing has been made out against him. He is released." End quote. So, as you can see, there's a bit to unpack here. First off, Walpole confirms his musical ability, a trifecta of singing, composing, and bowing the violin. Second, Walpole basically asserts that the Count is insane, and also hints at the rumors surrounding his origin and mysterious wealth, so much that the Prince of Wales has become obsessed with him. You don't just command that kind of attention for no reason. Third, Walpole indicates that the Count was incredibly charismatic, as he was released without trouble during a period of high paranoia, despite never revealing his identity. So, who was this man? From all the people he met in his confirmed lifetime, the Count of Saint Germain was described as a male of average height, who was somewhat muscular. In a different letter written by Walpole, some more details were provided. He recorded that the Count was quite pale and had extremely black hair and a beard. This was, of course, his very early days, and the Count would not retain this look. However, Walpole would mention a consistent feature. Quote, he dressed magnificently and had several jewels. End quote. Indeed, all who met the Count would agree that he boasted a flamboyant appearance, flowing with color, and almost every one of his outfits had a number of precious jewels sewn into them. We'll definitely be exploring his love for jewels later on, as it's actually a key piece of this mystery. The Count also always presented himself in French as the Comte de saint germain while also admitting that he wasn't French. And speaking of how he presented himself, the Count was not one for formality, and spoke as frank, uncouth, and madly as he felt, always with the utmost confidence. His strong personality would command every room he entered. Reportedly, the Italian adventurer and playboy, Giacomo Casanova, would get annoyed with him at the dinner table, simply because the Count talked endlessly with his seemingly bottomless barrel of stories that entertained high royalty and lovely ladies alike. The Count of Saint Germain was well conscious of his superiority. In his memoirs, the French politician and royal Charles Henry Baron de Glyken described his first time meeting him at a dinner party, quote, He threw down his hat and sword, sat down in an armchair near the fire, and interrupted the conversation by saying to the man who was speaking, You do not know what you are saying. I am the only person who is competent to speak on this subject, and I have exhausted it. It was the same with music, which I gave up when I found I had no more to learn." End quote. Though the Count was obviously educated and trained, his utter mastery of multiple fields proved inexplicable. Horace Walpole even wrote, quote, He was too great a musician not to have been famous if he had not been a gentleman. End quote. So, Obviously, he was a gifted musician, but he was also a master painter. Baron de Glyken's memoirs recalled a day when the Count invited him to his house. Quote, the paintings he showed me all bore a stamp of singularity or perfection, which made them more interesting than many works of art of the highest order. End quote. Unfortunately, as far as I can tell, none of the paintings made by the Count of Saint Germain have survived or been identified in modern day. But this account from Baron de Glyken was 
just one of many to reference his striking talent as an artist. Regarding the Count's ability as a polyglot, a speaker of multiple languages, Horace Walpole did provide an interesting detail that may hint at his true background. According to Walpole, quote, he spoke Italian and French with the greatest facility, though it was evident that neither was his language. He understood Polish and soon learned to understand English and talk it a little, but Spanish or Portuguese seemed to be his natural language, end quote. Interestingly, in all of his eventful appearances and influential actions in Europe, not a single one occurred in Spain or Portugal, so it does make you wonder, if he had been born in one of these countries, why he might have left and never returned. After the Count of Saint Germain was released by London authorities in 1745, he quickly gathered his things, severed ties with those he met, and left the British Isles. From here, he vanished without a trace for more than 14 years. This wouldn't be the last time the Count demonstrated his ability to completely disappear, but it was the one that led him to the turning point of his career, and the beginning of his dominating and perplexing reputation across Europe. In 1758, the Count of Saint Germain showed up suddenly and inexplicably in France specifically in his then capital city of Versailles, the home of the French royal family. As an alchemist, he claimed to have recipes for rare and precious dyes, which landed him in the presence of Madame de Pompadour, the chief mistress of the French king, Louis XV. Casanova recounts, quote, He had contrived to gain the favor of Madame de Pompadour, who had spoken about him to the king. The king had given him a suite of rooms at Chambord and a hundred thousand francs for the construction of a laboratory." End quote. This makes the Count's mastery of alchemy undeniable, as it was this skill specifically that landed him private quarters in the Chateau de Chambord, a massive and ornate palace owned by the French king. Yes, this man who hadn't been heard of for over a decade simply showed up in France talked his way up to the queen and won himself a free apartment in the king's palace. This is indisputable history. Just one year later, in 1749, he would become an official member of Louis XV's royal court, as a personal diplomat of the king. In fact, they were so close that if anybody in the count's life ever came to know his true identity, it probably would have been Louis XV. Many people consider them to be best friends. For entire evenings, the king would shut himself in a room with his chief mistress, Madame de Pompadour, and the Count of Saint Germain, indulging in the conversations they had and treating the Count with absolute respect for his range of knowledge. This close friendship obviously spurred jealousy in Louis's court, and ultimately, it turned the Count into a well known celebrity across all of Europe. It was also when Giacomo Casanova first met the man who would become his perfect rival. If you don't know who Casanova is, he was an accomplished Italian adventurer who became remarkably famous for his elaborate affairs with women. He claimed to have slept with at least 136 women, though historians believe that number may have been hundreds higher. Reflecting on his sexual conquests, Casanova wrote, quote, I never found any occupation more important. Feeling that I was born for the sex opposite of mine, I have always loved it and done all that I could to make myself loved by it." End quote. Casanova's reputation was so profound and enduring that today his name can be found in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, an informal noun with the definition, a man known for seducing women and having many lovers. You may think no man could ever rival Casanova, but the Count of Saint Germain would. After his very first meeting with the Count at a dinner party, Casanova was utterly baffled and wrote, quote, This individual, instead of eating, talked from the beginning of the meal to the end. It may safely be said that as a conversationalist, he was unequaled. He was a scholar, linguist, musician, and chemist, good-looking and a perfect ladies' man, end quote. Casanova would also introduce one of the most important details of the story. Quote, this extraordinary man would say in an easy, assured manner 
that he was 300 years old, that he knew the secret of the universal medicine, that he possessed a mastery over nature. All this, he said, was a mere trifle to him." End quote. To this day, there are easily tens of thousands of people and entire religions that believe the Count of Saint Germain was a genuine immortal being. We'll get into those religious beliefs, such as those held by Theosophy, near the end, but there are legitimate reasons why this belief is so widely maintained. The handsome, youthful look of the Count, noticed by Casanova, would also be noted by almost everyone he met. They described him as looking around 40 years old. But the thing is, as the years passed, the Count didn't seem to get any older. And decades later, several of these people would report seeing the same man, unaffected by age. Most of these reports come after his alleged death, though his death itself is seriously questionable. What's important to note, though, is that during his time in France, the Count of Saint Germain was known to keep a mysterious vial of liquid with him, tucked under his coat. When he was asked about it, he not so subtly suggested that it was a magical potion he had concocted himself, and that it was somehow connected to his youthful appearance. Remember, he told Casanova that he was at least 300 years old. Casanova would also write that, quote, he flattered women not that he would make them young again, which he modestly confessed was beyond him, but that their beauty would be preserved by a means of a wash." End quote. The recipe for this wash was likely one of the recipes he promised to deliver to the French royal family. At the time, most people believed in the existence of such a legendary liquid, one that had only been created a handful of times in history and only ever by master alchemists, which the Count of Saint Germain was. In alchemy, this liquid is known as the elixir of life. So let's back up a bit and talk briefly about alchemy. What is alchemy? Well, alchemy turned into what we know today as chemistry. However, where chemistry is a hard science, alchemy is an occult science, as well as an ancient branch of natural philosophy. Like chemical combinations, alchemy combined laboratory experimentation with spiritual and metaphysical concepts. The ultimate goal of alchemy, its great work or magnum opus, was the creation of the Philosopher's Stone, which was less of a stone and more of a chemical substance imbued with almost magical properties. The Philosopher's Stone was said to be the key to turning base metals such as lead into gold. And the same substance was also believed to be the key ingredient in the elixir of life, a potion that supposedly grants the drinker immortality. Alchemy is one of the oldest occult sciences that has been continually studied, practiced, and built upon, with the first documented techniques found in ancient Egypt some 5,000 years ago. However, the ancient Egyptians had learned their foundational techniques from Mesopotamia, the true birthplace of alchemy. Interestingly, the first accepted reference to the elixir of life is found in the Mesopotamian Epic of Gilgamesh, where the hero Gilgamesh seeks out a man named Utnapishtim, who had achieved immortality. Utnapishtim then instructs Gilgamesh to find a specific boxthorn-like plant at the bottom of the sea and consume it for eternal life. The idea that the elixir of life was more than just a plant, but a potion, will come some centuries later, but the strange part about it is that this idea of a drinkable potion that could grant eternal life was independently invented at least three times, the first in what is modern-day Iraq, the second either in India or China, and the third in Japan. Ancient Vedic scriptures describe the elixir of life in detail and Amrita, as the elixir is called, remains a key concept in multiple Indian religions, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. Even the tiniest sip of Amrita would grant immortality. In ancient China, Qing Shi Huang, the founder of the Qing dynasty, 
sent his Taoist alchemist Shu Fu and armies of literally thousands to find the correct substance to form the elixir, all to no avail. His ancient ancestors had developed theories though, that certain precious substances, when turned into a drink, would bestow eternal life. Ironically, this idea would result in the death of multiple Chinese emperors, who ingested elixirs made from poisonous substances such as mercury. As the intrigue of alchemy spread across the world and especially into Europe, the elixir of life remained in the realm of feasibility. It was just a matter of the mastery of alchemy and formulating a recipe using the right substance, perhaps the boxthorn-like plant sought out by Gilgamesh. After all, if modern chemistry can create medicine to cure disease, and gerontologists, scientists who study aging, now speak of aging as if it were a disease, why would curing the aging process be outside the realm of possibility? If immortality still seems ridiculous, we can simply ask the tech multi-billionaires of today why they invest so much into anti-aging. Larry Page and Sergey Brin of Google, Peter Thiel of the PayPal Mafia, Jeff Bezos of Amazon and Larry Ellison of Oracle have each invested tens of millions and that's still a lowball figure. Larry Ellison in particular has invested at least 370 million US dollars into anti-aging. It may sound obvious, but many medicines are just a mixture of chemicals and most medicines are built off of existing chemical knowledge, then finally experimented with using trial and error until they achieve the desired effect. This is the same process of alchemy, except alchemy is far older than modern medicine and much like big pharmaceutical companies today, alchemists tended to guard their work in heavy secrecy, only to a far more extreme degree, and this is evident in how many alchemical writings have been coded using ciphers and symbolism. So for thousands of years, legends have stood regarding ancient alchemical secrets and achievements. Some alchemists such as Hermes Trismegistus and Nicholas Flamel are rumored to have achieved their magnum opus and successfully concocted the elixir of life, going on to live for eternity, and one other figure among them is the Count of Saint Germain. That vial of liquid he carried with him may have been the answer as to why he perfected so many skills spoke so many languages, accumulated his immense wealth, and had endless stories and histories to tell. Simply put, the Count was a man who was too good to be true, and that's how he amazed the most powerful people in the world. Even though many thought he was lying about his age, Casanova included, and some thought he was insane, like Horace Walpole, not a single person left his company able to explain how the Count was the man he was. Casanova summed this up quite well, quote, In spite of my own feelings, I thought him an astonishing man, as he was always astonishing me, end quote. For some, immortality seemed to be the only reasonable explanation, and many of the people who met and knew the Count genuinely believed that liquid was what kept him alive. After all, despite the Count's love for dinner parties, not a single person ever saw him eat, not even as a guest at the king's table, seriously. Remember, Casanova mentioned how at the dinner table, the count talked from the beginning of the meal to the end, instead of eating. And while at a dinner party in Vienna, the count himself once boasted, quote, has anyone ever seen me eat or drink, end quote. Indeed, this was a baffling part of his reputation, he would both attend and host lavish dinners with many guests and never touch a single dish. Obviously, he had to eat something, so he explained to people that his principal food was a simple mixture of oatmeal, which he prepared himself and consumed in private. You need to add liquid to raw oats in order to make oatmeal, so what liquid do you think he used? Madame de Gergi, a French socialite, once told Madame de Pompadour that the Count of Saint Germain had given her some of his special liquid in a bottle, and promised that it would preserve her appearance as a beautiful 25-year-old woman. She told de Pompadour that she cherished the gift, but was afraid to drink it. Later on, de Pompadour would ask the Count about his gift to Madame de Gergi, 
and whether this liquid of his could truly grant eternal youth. The Count simply replied, quote, It is not impossible, but I confess it is likely that this lady, for whom I have the greatest respect, is talking nonsense. End quote. Madame de Gergi had lied about the gift, but his possession of the elixir of immortality, well, it was not impossible. The Count's stay in the French royal court might have been the height of his fame as a celebrity, but it was only the beginning of his true influence on European politics and history. As I mentioned earlier, the surprisingly close friendship and trust shared between the French king Louis XV and the Count of Saint Germain stirred immense jealousy in the king's court, and it wasn't long before certain powerful figures began to make plans toward his demise. Specifically, in 1760, the Minister of the State, the Duke of Choiseul, accused the Count of espionage. And it wasn't hard to convince others who had never met the Count that a man who refuses to give his birth date, background, and real name and ascended to such a high position in a matter of less than a year was a spy. However, Louis XV was offended by such an accusation against his friend and provided the Count with legal protection. Moreover, Louis did not agree with the Duke of Choiseul's policy regarding Austria, so he decided to send the Count, his personal diplomat, to Holland in order to secretly begin peace negotiations with Prince Louis of Brunswick regarding Austria. Someone eventually informed the Duke of Choiseul though, and frothing with rage, he became all the more determined to see the Count of Saint Germain to his doom. While on this secret mission in Holland, the Count did what he perhaps does best. He obscured his identity, first pretending that he came from the French royal treasury to borrow money for Louis XV. Interestingly, the Count put down a mass of diamonds as collateral, diamonds that were his own and not Louis, and this quickly made him friends with the Dutch bankers Adrian and Thomas Hope, with whom he stayed. All was going according to plan, that is, until an anonymous contact informed the French minister in Holland, Monsieur de Affray, of the secret negotiation that was to take place in his jurisdiction without his permission or knowledge. This outraged Daffre, and he complained to the French Minister of State, who was, you guessed it, the Duke of Choiseul. The Duke immediately sent orders to the Dutch government, demanding the arrest and extradition of the Count of Saint Germain. The Duke then waited until the next Royal Council meeting, and in front of all the ministers of the French Council, he informed King Louis of the decision to arrest the Count. Because this was a top secret mission, the King wouldn't dare to admit in front of his council of ministers that he was central to this scandal. Thus, Louis's hands were tied. He put all blame on the Count and allowed the arrest to happen. Here's where the historical details get fuzzy though. The Count escaped, but there are two versions of exactly how it all went down. The first account tells that the Dutch authorities regarded this arrest warrant as internal French politicking. Basically, it was France's problem and not something that Holland should get involved with. However, it would be politically unwise to directly refuse to deport the Count. So to preserve the peace, the Dutch asked Britain for help, and the Brits sent the Count a blank British passport that he could fill in with any name he chose. which honestly sounds like a dream for a man with a pesky habit of vanishing. The second version of the story though is my personal favorite and the one I hope is true. In this account, an anonymous contact, perhaps Louis XV, sent word to Giacomo Casanova who happened to be staying in a hotel right next to where the Count was staying. So Casanova visited his rival and warned him of the arrest that was coming. The ending of both versions is the same. The Count of Saint Germain boarded a ship that was bound for England, and he would not be heard from or seen for at least a year. When he did reappear though, the Count was more enigmatic than ever, and fair warning, with his return comes a confusing and stark tonal shift in our story toward more profound historical events, mystical dealings, and hidden influence, showing us a side of the Count that will be increasingly relevant 
from this point forward. Over the next 17 years, the Count of Saint Germain would pop up across Europe, in each location meeting with powerful figures, then disappearing almost as suddenly as he showed up. This happened so frequently that Europe whispered with rumors beyond that of immortality. People began to think he could teleport. Indeed, the Count showed up in St. Petersburg, Berlin, Vienna, Milan, Amsterdam, Venice, Nuremberg, and at least six other major European cities. Many of these places were the home to the royal families of their respective countries, which makes it all the more strange that major historical events seemed to follow the Count wherever he went. For example, while in St. Petersburg, Russia, he met with Catherine the Great. Not much is known about this meeting, but today some theorize that the Count may have either inspired or helped conduct her successful takeover of Russia in 1762, when she overthrew her husband, Peter III from the throne, and crowned herself Empress. The scant but compelling evidence for this was that Count Alexei Orlov, a close comrade of Catherine the Great, met with the Count of Saint Germain a few years later in Italy and said of him, quote, Here is a man who played an important part in our revolution. End quote. Alexei's brother, Gregory Orlov, then handed the Count a case containing 20,000 gold coins. Why this gift or payment was made remains unclear, but it's not hard to put two and two together. Certainly, the details of this time period in the Count's life are hazy and subject to a lot of hearsay and legend, but yet another rumor began to be attached to his story, and that was that the Count of Saint Germain had become a leading figure in multiple major occult movements, including the Rosicrucian Order and Freemasonry. I'm saving those two for later though, as there's actually some pretty intriguing arguments that I want to get into, despite the lack of any hard evidence. Historically speaking though, there is documentation that during the Count's time in Vienna, he participated in founding two occult groups, the first known as the Society of Asiatic Brothers, and the second known as the Knights of Light, and both of these groups focused on the study of alchemy. In Germany, he was also spotted several times in the company of the hypnotist Franz Mesmer, and soon after these sightings, Mesmer would come up with the theory that there was an invisible energy possessed and emitted by all living things, and that this energy could create physical effects such as healing when harnessed. Thus, rumor has it that this theory, which is called animal magnetism, was inspired or even given to him by the Count of Saint Germain. Finally, there is a very strange story recorded in detail by the French Comtesse Gabrielle Pauline de Adamar. In 1774, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette had ascended to the French throne, and not long after, the Count apparently returned to France and attempted to meet with them. It had been 14 years since his arrest warrant in Holland, and in that time he had become a sort of legend in the royal court due to his inexplicable friendship with the previous king, Louis XV. With the new ruling powers though, his point of contact was Comtesse d'Adamar, who was the lady-in-waiting to Queen Marie Antoinette, and she helped him arrange a meeting with the Queen. According to d'Adamar's own records, the Count wasn't his fun-loving self at all during this visit, as he had come to deliver a grave warning in the form of prophetic visions that would occur 15 years into the future. Comtesse de Adamar recorded the entire conversation in detail, which was essentially a vague but accurate portrayal of the political struggle to come that would eventually lead to the French Revolution. He ended his prophecy by saying, quote, Not for long will the laws remain, the protection of the good and the terror of the wicked. The wicked will seize power with blood-stained hands. They will do away with the Catholic religion, the nobility, and the magistracy. Not even royalty will be left. There will be a bloodthirsty republic, whose scepter will be the executioner's knife." End quote. Indeed, the French Revolution, which began in 1789 and ended in 1799, would lead to the overthrow of the existing French monarchy, the loss of state control of the Catholic Church, and the execution of both Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette by guillotine. 
So either the Comtesse de Adamar lied about the Count's visit and her prophecy in her memoirs, or the Count of Saint Germain possessed a genuine power of precognition, the ability to foresee the future. While those 17 mysterious years through Europe are subject to much debate, thankfully the accepted historical documentation of the Count of Saint Germain becomes re-established in the year 1779, when he arrived in Altona, today a city in Germany, though apparently he had been in Germany for the previous three years under the name Count Weldon, selling alchemical recipes for rare cosmetics and dyes, just as he had during his early days in France. However, in Altona, he introduced himself as the Count of Saint Germain to Prince Charles of Hesse Castle, who he likely met through one of the several secret societies they were both involved in. The Count showed the Prince several of his most precious gemstones, then demonstrated his skills in alchemy. This apparently impressed Prince Charles so much that he immediately purchased a factory in the nearby town of Eckenforda for the Count and supplied him with all the materials he needed to create his special dyes. It was far more than business though. If these two would become such good friends that the prince went on to construct a full-scale laboratory inside his own summer home so that the Count of Saint Germain could conduct more elaborate alchemical experiments. And Charles would join the Count in the laboratory quite often and together they created gemstones and jewelry. And this was how the Count of Saint Germain spent his so-called last years. In 1784, something happened that should never happen to an immortal. The Count of Saint Germain died. For a man who apparently survived solely off of oatmeal, he must have not had enough nutrition to support a healthy immune system because he became deathly sick from pneumonia, well, according to Prince Charles. Allegedly, during this time, the Count had become bedridden with his illness and announced to the Prince that he was tired of life. He seemed quite depressed and refused to see a doctor, and the only people he allowed to tend to his ailments were women. Finally, he called Prince Charles over to his bedside in order to make a confession, the true identity of the man who called himself the Count of Saint Germain. The Count revealed to the Prince that he was an exiled royal of Transylvania, the eldest son of Prince Francis Ricosi II. He said that he spent many of his younger years at the University of Siena in Italy, which at the time was considered the best education anyone could get, and he graduated with honors in multiple subjects, hence his incredible range of knowledge and skill. By the way, this claimed identity is absolutely vital to this mystery, and we'll be investigating it in depth at the end. After this confession was made, Prince Charles and the many ladies left him to rest. The Count of Saint Germain would then proceed to die alone, with no one there to witness it. He was buried soon after in an unmarked grave, and later, all of his belongings were auctioned off, with the exception of a packet of secret documents that was given to Prince Charles. Among the Count's belongings were basic clothing, a few shillings, a toothbrush, a comb, and a few other sundries. Notably, no gold, jewels, or diamonds that he possessed were listed in his belongings, nor personal items such as his precious violin. The Count never married or had any children, well, as far as anyone knows. Casanova might have disagreed, but during the Count's life, he claimed to be a celibate, which meant he had no sex. What's clear, though, is that his death revealed about as much as his life. That is to say, we're not left with many answers, only more mysteries. 1784 marks the end of the confirmed historical existence of the Count of Saint Germain. However, despite having apparently died, immortality seems to make death a bit of a difficult task. Official Freemason documents record the Count of Saint Germain as the chosen representative of the French Masons for a major convention that took place in 1785, just one year after his reported death, and at this convention, both 
Alessandro Cagliostro and Franz Mesmer were present, both of whom had associated with the Count during his life. The Freemasons are, of course, a secret society, so whether the Count actually showed up is unknown, at least to the public. However, it wouldn't be long before reports of genuine appearances began to surface. The Comtesse de Adamar, the same who arranged the prophetic meeting between the Count and Marie Antoinette, claimed to have had a long conversation with him in 1789 in the Church of the Recollet after the revolutionary events of the storming of the Bastille. She wrote that his face looked no older than it had when she last saw him 15 years prior, and apparently he told her that he had just returned from a lengthy voyage across China and Japan. The Comtesse de Adamar is perhaps our primary and most detailed source for most of the sightings after the Count's reported death, so whether or not you trust her is up to you, but if she is telling the truth, we may be dealing with a genuine immortal. Some 30 years later, in 1821, the Comtesse de Adamar would write in her diary, quote, I have seen Saint Germain again, each time to my amazement. I saw him when the Queen was murdered, on the 18th of Brumaire, on the day following the death of the Duc de Anguille in January 1815, and on the eve of the murder of the Duc de Berry." End quote. All of these dates she mentioned, by the way, were incredibly important events that would dramatically change the governing system of France, as well as produce tremendous ripples across Europe. While the Count was certainly a political influence in his known life, these claims by de Adamar would essentially elevate his status from an immortal eccentric alchemist to something of a much more profound purpose, a being capable of not only changing entire political landscapes, but creating a future as he sees fit. That definitely qualifies as a demigod, which is why, as you'll see, there are entire religions in which the Count of Saint Germain is a central figure. All things make sense in context, and you can see how the truth or lore of de Adamar's claims are so vitally important. However, the documentation that seems to indicate that the Count was involved in the rise of Catherine the Great in Russia, that's strangely consistent with the records given by de Adamar. Make of that what you will. I won't go into the less notable claims of meetings and sightings, because there were many, and some are more or less believable than others. And these rumors went on with such regularity that the first president of France, Napoleon III, actually ordered one of his librarians to collect as much information on the Count of Saint Germain as possible, instructing them to dig into France's old archives, particularly those from the era of Louis XV. The Count's reputation certainly preceded him during the centuries after his supposed death especially that of his claimed longevity. His unwitnessed death in Eckenforda, his unmarked burial plot, and his missing personal items such as his beloved violin, jewel collection, and paintings didn't satisfy anyone. The posthumous sightings of him alive were mere icing on the Enigma cake. As the possibility that Europe was dealing with a real-life immortal grew, people began to take the rumors that the Count had achieved alchemy's magnum opus far more seriously. And I'll be honest with you though, if we were to take a leap and believe in immortality, alchemy may be the answer here. We already briefly discussed the scientific plausibility of anti-aging, which is accepted today by both gerontologists and some of the most powerful leaders of the technology sector. And we know for a fact that, all legends aside, the Count of Saint Germain was an incredible alchemist who managed to impress on the very first demonstration every single time. You may not expect it, but the strongest evidence for the elixir of life are those jewels the Count was famous for, the ones he loved to show off in every way imaginable. However vain it may sound, we know by now that this intense love of jewels perfectly fits the Count's flamboyant, room-commanding personality. Everything about him was over the top. The Count was eccentric for sure, but there is no denying that his jewel situation was suspicious. For example, his favorite articles of clothing 
all had precious gems sewn into them. He also fit a ridiculous number of diamonds into his shoes and garters, and those alone were thought to be worth more than 200,000 francs, which, if my calculations are correct, was well over a hundred thousand US dollars today. He also carried a casket filled with diamonds everywhere he went, which, as you remember, was used as collateral during his stay with the Dutch bankers while on his secret mission in Holland. His love for jewels was such an important part of who he was that the Count even included them in his original artworks. According to the memoirs of Baron de Glyken, the royal who visited the Count's home, the figures the Count painted were covered in jewels with colors so vivid that the subject's face looked pale in comparison. Though, as we learned, none of his paintings survived, so we're only left to imagine. I'll tell you a real mystery though. Where in the world did the Count keep his vast amounts of wealth? Surely it was far more than the casket of diamonds he carried around. However, no bank account has ever been linked to any of his known aliases. Regardless, this man was beyond wealthy. He literally gave away precious gems to people who amused him. In one instance, he gave away a golden cross that was ornamented with white and green gems to Madame de Hossett, a woman he had just met, simply because she commented on his beauty. Believing that the stones were fake, she later had the cross valued and all were confirmed as genuine. The Count also presented his friend Louis XV with a large diamond worth 10,000 livres, which is an old and confusing French currency, but I believe it converts to nearly 21,000 US dollars today. It is true that the Count sold rare dyes and owned a factory, but he was independently wealthy before this, and not a single soul knew where it all came from. So, here's where the alchemy comes into play. Above all other talents, the Count was most respected for his mastery of alchemy, and we remember that the Philosopher's Stone, the legendary ingredient of the Elixir of Life, is also the key to transmuting base metals into gold. So perhaps this would have been an easy answer to account for his otherwise inexplicable wealth, which he seemed to have an endless supply of, and never was he seen withdrawing from a bank. Thus, if the legend of the Philosopher's Stone is true, the Count may have literally been creating his own money through alchemy. And as for his diamonds, Casanova wrote in his memoirs that the Count openly claimed that, quote, he could melt diamonds, professing himself capable of forming out of 10 or 12 small diamonds, one large one of the finest water without any loss of weight." End quote. Beyond this, the Count made other alchemical claims, such as his ability to remove flaws from diamonds, as well as increase the size of pearls. And as for the pearls, those in his possession were said to be remarkably large. As is believed in alchemical tradition, if a person is capable of creating gold or manipulating diamonds through alchemy, they almost definitely possess the secret of the Philosopher's Stone, which in turn makes it likely they achieved immortality through the elixir of life as well. One medieval alchemist in particular is thought to have achieved this, and his name is Nicholas Flamel. During his lifetime, Flamel was a manuscript seller who was in possession of some of the most rare and treasured alchemical texts, and later he was noted for his immense wealth and generosity. Some 200 years after Flamel's historically accepted death, a large number of complex alchemical texts appeared that were attributed to him, and they revealed a very different story of a man history almost entirely overlooked. According to the texts, in the year 1378, Flamel came into possession of a mysterious and ancient 21-page manuscript. He traveled to Spain for help with translation, but along the way he met a wandering Christian convert of Jewish descent who was able to identify certain key aspects of the manuscript, so much so that Flamel himself could begin decoding the text. So for the next few years, Flamel and his wife decoded all 21 pages and in them they discovered a hidden recipe for the Philosopher's Stone, which they proceeded to recreate in their lab. In 1382, they successfully produced silver, and not long after, they produced gold. By association, 
alchemist who read these texts on Flamel's secret discovery concluded that Flamel had also produced the Elixir of Life, as it was the obvious next step, having created the Philosopher's Stone. Though the story of Nicholas Flamel is of controversial origin, it's never been fully debunked, and many have even argued for its authenticity. Flamel was indeed a real person in history too, and one of the most popular theories of who the Count of Saint Germain may have actually been. After his historical yet questionable death, what became of increasing relevance was the Count's deep involvement in occult groups and secret societies during his life, especially for someone who, according to Casanova, claimed to possess a mastery over Mother Nature. We're talking about some seriously ancient and esoteric knowledge, exactly the kind that these secret societies concern themselves with. I already mentioned that the Count of Saint Germain helped found the Society of Asiatic Brothers, as well as the Knights of Light sometime in the late 1760s. As far as I can tell, neither of these groups have survived into modern day, but it's quite possible that one or both were absorbed into a larger group, and two groups during that time were gaining immense traction in the occult community. I'm speaking of the Rosicrucian Order, as well as Freemasonry. As for the Rosicrucian Order, they were a group that, since their founding in the early 1600s, and possibly as early as 1407 if you ask the Rosicrucians, they claimed to possess esoteric wisdom that derived from the ancient past, but more than spiritual knowledge, they spoke of tangible insight into the physical universe that has been deliberately hidden from the average man for thousands of years. Alchemy, alongside occult magic such as Kabbalah, were central to this sort of manipulation of nature. While during his lifetime, the Count never admitted to practicing Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism and a system of practical magic, many, such as the Marquis de Crecy, speculated that the Count was, in fact, of Jewish descent. Likewise, many do believe that he had some involvement with the Rosicrucian Order. However, there is no proof, except in the writings of the influential Rosicrucian, Max Heindel, where Heindel describes the Count of Saint Germain as a reincarnation of Christian Rosenkreutz, the enigmatic and somewhat mythological founder of the Rosicrucians. Regarding the Freemasons, though, there is far more for us to go off of. Though most modern Masons deny that the Count had any involvement in Freemasonry, there is the matter of that official document from 1785 that listed him as a representative of the French Masons. Then there is the influential Freemason, as well as fellow alchemist, Alessandro Cagliostro, who wrote in his memoirs that the Count of Saint Germain founded the Freemason Lodge in Germany. Moreover, Cagliostro revealed that the Count was the very reason he himself even joined the Masons in the first place. The two first met in London during the Count's second visit there in May of 1760, where they bonded over their shared occult knowledge, especially that of alchemy. According to Cagliostro's memoirs, the Count became his mentor and was the one to initiate him in the Masonic Rite, known as the Ancient and Primitive Rite of Memphis Misrime. And just like the Count, Cagliostro would then go on to become extremely famous across Europe, especially among the royal elite so much so that he was recommended as a personal physician to the American statesman Benjamin Franklin during his stay in Paris. And that last detail on Benjamin Franklin brings us to our next Masonic rumor. One of the most popular and wild legends of the Count of Saint Germain is that he assisted in the creation of the American Constitution. Frankly, there is zero proof of this, but you take a man who has a history of powerful political influence, who is also apparently a highly esteemed member of the Freemasons, and then consider that the Freemasons were an international secret society that included a surprising number of the famous forefathers of American political history. Confirmed members of the Freemasons include George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Paul Revere, and John Hancock. However, the Freemasons were and remain a secret society, so these are only names that are actually confirmed. Many others have been speculated. Regardless, historians today believe that 9 of the 56 men 
that signed the Declaration of Independence were Masons, and 13 of the 39 that signed the US Constitution were also Masons. Whether the Count of Saint Germain had any influence on American history remains entirely unknown, but the timeline does seem to match up. Returning back to his mentorship of the alchemist Alessandro Cagliostro, there is a theory that they co-authored a document known as the Most Holy Trinosophia, Trinosophia meaning threefold wisdom. The Trinosophia is a highly coded text that is written in an elaborate mixture of French, Arabic, Chaldean Hebrew, cuneiform, Ionic Greek, Syriac, and esoteric hieroglyphs. In modern day, the contents have been successfully translated, revealing a ritual Egyptian magical treatise, as well as a complex chemical allegory, which was an alchemist's ideal way to pass on their most prized alchemical secrets, as only the worthy would ever understand. The Trinosophia remains a central codex in both Masonic and Rosicrucian studies, and the only surviving copy of this text is held in the library of Troyes, France. No one knows for sure who authored the Trinosophia, though in the front of this copy is a bookseller's note stating explicitly that it is the sole existing copy of the famous Trinosophia of the Comte de Saint-Germain, as the original was destroyed by the Count himself. This note also adds that Cagliostro had owned this volume, which was seized from him during his arrest by the Catholic Church in 1789 during the Inquisition in Rome. This arrest and seizure of books definitely happened, and interestingly, it was due to Cagliostro trying to found a Freemason lodge in Rome. It also resulted in him being sentenced to death. One of the foremost authorities in ancient occultism, Manly P. Hall, wrote of the mysterious author of the Trinosophia, quote, The personage who gathered the material in this manuscript was indeed one whose spiritual understanding might be envied. He found these various texts in different parts of Europe, no doubt, and that he had a true knowledge of their import is proved by the fact that he attempted to conceal some 40 fragmentary ancient texts by scattering them within the lines of his own writing." End quote. If the Count of Saint Germain authored or co-authored this book alongside Cagliostro, it would be the Count's only known occult writing from his historical lifetime. It's now time to make crystal clear just how profound the influence of the Count of Saint Germain was in the occult world after his historical death. Though he may have involved himself with the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians during his life, and possibly after, the occult religion known as Theosophy takes this mystical side of the Count to an entirely different level. Some may even say that Theosophy deified him, and certainly some offshoot sects of Theosophy today, such as the so-called I Am Activity, quite literally worship him. All Theosophists though, regardless of sect, assert that the Count of Saint Germain is still alive. Theosophy considers the Count of Saint Germain to be a master of ancient wisdom, which is a central concept in their religion. The masters of ancient wisdom are supposed to be a group of enlightened beings who are credited with godlike powers, such as that of teleportation, levitation, passing through walls, telepathic communication, and, of course, the ability to live incredibly long lives. Note that the masters are not thought to be immortal. More on that in a bit. According to Theosophy, the greatest masters to ever live include the Hindu deity Krishna, the Buddha Siddhartha Gautama, and Jesus Christ. Generally speaking, the goal of these masters is to steer humanity by way of secretly influencing events and manipulating the course of history, something which absolutely reflects many of the older legends of the Count of Saint Germain. Between the years of 1849 and 1869, the masters of ancient wisdom decided to communicate their sacred knowledge, that which led them to true enlightenment, to the future founder of Theosophy, a Russian woman named Helena Blavatsky. For many years, Blavatsky studied under them in Tibet and recorded her conversations with them privately. It was only later that she convinced two of the masters to open communication with two of her most trusted colleagues, and 
Finally, the existence of the Masters was revealed to the public at large, and the occult religion known as Theosophy was born. The Count of Saint Germain was not one of these original two Masters, but he is considered among their enlightened rank, and apparently he did eventually communicate with the influential Theosophists Charles Ledbetter and Guy Ballard. Both of these people claim to have met the Count well after his supposed death, with significant documentation to go along with it. Helena Blavatsky herself claimed to have met the Count too. In fact, there is a mysterious photo supposedly of them together, alongside two other Masters of Ancient Wisdom named Kuthumi and Moria. Blavatsky also claimed to be in possession of a number of secret documents written by the Count, which she used in her Theosophical teachings. So, Charles Ledbetter's encounter occurred in 1926, when he met the Count of Saint Germain in Rome. He described the Count as having brown eyes, olive colored skin, and a pointed beard, and that his presence commanded intense and forceful reverence, as was expected by a master of ancient wisdom. Ledbetter went on to say that the Count told him that he now lives in a castle in Transylvania, where he practices occult rituals while wearing a special outfit, which he then showed to Ledbetter. Ledbetter described this artifact as, quote, a suit of golden chainmail which once belonged to a Roman emperor. Over it is thrown a magnificent cloak of Tyrian purple, with on its clasp a seven-pointed star in diamond and amethyst, and sometimes he wears a glorious robe of violet, end quote. This color, violet, the color of amethyst, is today an essential trait associated with the Master of Wisdom, the Count of Saint Germain. In Theosophy, he is sometimes referred to as the Violet Flame, and as the Master of the Seventh Ray. These seven rays are supposedly seven metaphysical principles that govern the unfolding of each astrological age, each of which are exactly 2,158 years long and the seventh ray is supposed to be violet in color. As for Guy Ballard's encounter with the Count of Saint Germain, his became far more prolific than Ledbetter's, so much so that it actually spun off into its own religion. Honestly speaking though, Ballard's story is weird. In 1930, Guy Ballard was living at the base of Mount Shasta, an active volcano in California that's been associated with strange paranormal activity dating back to the Native American tribes who originally inhabited the area. I promise I'll eventually investigate Mount Shasta in depth, as is one of my most requested topics, but for now, this is where Guy Ballard both lived and loved to hike. And it was during one of his hikes that his haunting encounter with the Count of Saint Germain happened. Ballard records, quote, It came time for lunch, and I sought a mountain spring for clear, cold water. Cup in hand, I bent down to fill it, when an electrical current passed through my body from head to toe. I looked around, and directly behind me stood a young man, who, at first glance, seemed to be someone on a hike like myself. I looked more closely and realized immediately that he was no ordinary person. As this thought passed through my mind, he smiled and addressed me, saying, My brother, if you will hand me your cup, I will give you a much more refreshing drink than spring water. I obeyed, and instantly the cup was filled with a creamy liquid. Handing it back to me, he said, Drink it. End quote. Ballard would supposedly go on to have a number of meetings and communications with this man, who later identified himself as the Count of St. Germain. Apparently, the Count had chosen Guy Ballard his wife Edna, and later his son, Edona, as his sole accredited messengers. Together, they published many books containing his philosophical and spiritual teachings, known as the Saint Germain series, and Ballard himself lectured tirelessly, establishing a movement he called the I Am Activity. If you're wondering, I Am refers to an ancient Sanskrit mantra, Soham, which essentially means I am that I am. By 1938, Ballard's I Am activity had accumulated well over a million followers, and it still exists today, operated by its parent organization, the Saint Germain Foundation. Be warned though, the I Am activity is a considerably more cultish offshoot of Theosophy, 
So we should return back to the core of what were Theosophy's original beliefs regarding the Count of Saint Germain. And those come from the founder of Theosophy, the adept of the masters of ancient wisdom, Helena Blavatsky. In May of 1881, Blavatsky wrote an article for her publication, The Theosophist, describing her thoughts on the Count at length. Quote, the Count Saint Germain is, until this very time, a living mystery. The countless authorities we have in literature, as well as in oral tradition, which is sometimes the more trustworthy, about this wonderful Count's having been met and recognized in different centuries, is no myth. This pupil of Hindu and Egyptian hierophants, this holder of the secret knowledge of the East, was not appreciated for who he was. The stupid world has always treated in this way men who, like Saint Germain, have returned to it after long years of seclusion devoted to study, with their hands full of the treasure of esoteric wisdom and with the hope of making the world better, wiser, and happier." End quote. I promised that I would explain the concept that none of the masters of ancient wisdom are immortal, including the Count of Saint Germain which is notable, as we're talking about a highly mystical religion that absolutely asserts the reality of supernatural power. Some theosophists have implied that the masters can live for up to a thousand years, but even that's apparently an exaggeration. According to Blavatsky herself, quote, The master's knowledge and learning are immense, and their personal holiness of life is still greater. Still, they are mortal men, and none of them a thousand years old, as imagined by some. I have never heard of a mortal man, layman or adept, who could live even half the 969 years allotted to Methuselah. Some adepts do exceed, by a good deal, what you would call the ordinary age. Yet there is nothing miraculous in it, and very few of them care to live very long. End quote. So, let's do some math. We know that the Count first appeared in England sometime in the early 1740s, and by then he was already a grown man, described as looking around 40 years old. So if we estimate that he was born in 1710 at the latest, and he's still around today, that would make him around 312 years old, as of the making of this video. Blavatsky also made a reference to Methuselah, a biblical figure written to have lived 969 years and said that no master has ever come even close to half of that, which is 484 and a half years. Therefore, according to Helena Bovatsky, the Count of Saint Germain today has around 100 to an upper limit of 172 years left to live. That is, if he cares enough to live that long. Of course, if the Count truly was a master of ancient wisdom, he could have been born much earlier than 1710, and this leads us to our final discussion. That is, the origin of the Count of Saint Germain, and finally, the most compelling case for his true identity. Alchemy, magic, and theosophy aside, the most important question we can ask today is the one with which we began. That is, who was the Count of Saint Germain? Speaking literally, every man, even one who achieved immortality, has a beginning. Thus, many people have speculated on the early life of the Count, as it likely holds the key to this entire mystery. Like his birth date, the birthplace of the Count of Saint Germain is unknown. But Horace Walpole did include an interesting hint, writing that, quote, Spanish or Portuguese seem to be his natural language, end quote. Thus, according to the showman P.T. Barnum, people speculated that the Count was, quote, a Spanish Jesuit named Aymar, and others again intimate that his true title was the Marquis de Betmar, and that he was a native of Portugal, end quote. Besides the connection to Walpole's statement, there is almost no evidence to back up any of these claims, though. However, there are two people who, out of all those who befriended him, these two almost definitely knew the true identity of the Count of Saint Germain, with one hiding the secret for the rest of his life, and the other possibly letting it loose. 
the first person is King Louis XV. King Louis displayed such an intense respect and admiration for the Count that it shocked his court. And all things considered, it truly seemed like they were best friends. They enjoyed countless hours of conversation behind closed doors, and the king seemed to offer him legal protection that allowed the count to continue obscuring his identity and past, unhindered. Even President Napoleon III believed that Louis XV knew the count's identity. This is why he sent his librarian on a mission to dig through Louis's archives. However, Louis never revealed the secret of the count, nor a single detail of his true identity. The second suspect is Prince Charles of Hesse Castle, who the Count of St. Germain spent his final years with. Despite the Count's reputation for exerting his superiority on just about everyone besides the King, he treated Prince Charles as a true equal, and it was Charles who the Count entrusted a number of secret documents to upon his death from pneumonia in 1784. And in a letter written 40 years later, in 1825, Prince Charles revealed to a friend that he was the only person who the Count truly confided in. Unlike Louis XV, Prince Charles did reveal the supposed true identity of the Count of Saint Germain. Charles said that on his deathbed, the Count revealed his greatest secret, that he was of royal Transylvanian blood, that he was the lost son of Prince Francis Ricosi II. Here's a historical fact for you. The eldest son of Prince Francis Ricosi II, whose name was Leopold George, was reported to have died at the age of four. However, the final will of Ricosi II includes this eldest son, despite him supposedly being dead. Now, why would a deceased prince's money and possessions be given to a long-deceased son? Well, maybe someone here wasn't really dead. Today, historians believe that Leopold George, who disappeared off record at the age of four, was deliberately hidden and had his identity changed. But why? Well, it's thought that this was in order to spare Leopold from the persecutions that were ongoing against the Habsburg dynasty, of which focus was bound to turn toward him as the prince's eldest son. This is just speculation, though as it's never been truly understood why Vercozzi II chose to hide only his eldest son. In 1911, a genealogy study was conducted by the theosophist Annie Besant that helped flush out the events as they would have occurred. Despite Besant's involvement in theosophy, what her study found remains generally accepted by historians. The study revealed that the children of Prince Francis Vercozzi II were actually raised by the Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I for their own protection, as it was a tumultuous time in Central Europe with many violent uprisings. For unknown reasons, though, at some point the eldest child, Leopold George, was withdrawn from the guardianship of the Holy Roman Emperor. Records show that the child had died, but we now know that wasn't the truth. The best theory that this genealogy study put forth is that the four-year-old Leopold George was secretly delivered to Jan Gastone, the last descendant of the Medici family, who were an Italian banking dynasty. Allegedly, Gastone was Leopold's mother's brother-in-law. Gastone went on to raise Leopold in Italy, primarily in the little countryside town of San Germano, where Gastone owned his favorite estates. And San Germano, of course, is where Leopold picked up his most cherished pseudonym, the Count of St. Germain. This would account for his incredible wealth, as not only did little Leopold have the patronage of his own father, Ricosi II, but we may also speculate that the Holy Roman Emperor, Leopold I, and Jan Gastone, the final descendant of the Medici banking dynasty, may have gifted him access to wealth beyond most people's wildest dreams. It also explains his access to an incredibly broad and high-quality education, which occurred at the University of Siena, and possibly the powerful network of people he seemed to have almost direct access to. This theory that the Count of Saint Germain was, in fact, this hidden child, Leopold George, is the strongest theory we have today regarding his true identity, the one generally accepted by historians and theosophists alike 
as well as what the Count himself admitted to while on his deathbed. However, the Count was an incredibly smart man who deliberately concealed his identity all throughout his known existence. So who really knows if this is yet another elaborate tale he made up, a red herring to obscure his true identity forever, by intentionally piecing together a historically sensible answer. It should be said though, that the Count of Saint Germain being the eldest son of Prince Francis Ricosi II, doesn't debunk the possibility of immortality or longevity. If you believe in alchemy, anyone can drink the elixir of life, and if you're a theosophist, you know that, theoretically, anyone can achieve the enlightenment of a master of ancient wisdom. It's just extremely unlikely, and that's a massive understatement. Today, many still believe that the Count walks among us, simply going by a different name as he was known to do. In the memoirs of the Englishman, Albert Van Dam, published in 1892, he writes of a man he befriended in Paris, who was of average height, strong build, and appeared to be in the range of 40 to 50 years old. Quote, he called himself Major Fraser, lived alone, and never alluded to his family. Moreover, he was lavish with money, though the source of his fortune remained a mystery to everyone. He possessed a marvelous knowledge of all the countries in Europe at all periods. His memory was absolutely incredible, and curiously enough, he often gave his hearers to understand that he had acquired his learning elsewhere than from books. Many is the time he has told me, with a strange smile, that he was certain he had known Nero, had spoken with Dante, and so on." End quote. It's something of a comforting feeling, believing that the Count may still be living his strange and eccentric lifestyle somewhere to this day adventuring and resting wherever he pleases, and inspiring all those he meets with his opulent jewels, fantastic stories, oatmeal mixtures, and loving ways with women. Though the true nature of the Count of Saint Germain is attested in the memoirs of his close friend, Prince Charles of Hesse Castle, quote, he was perhaps one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived, the friend of humanity, wishing for money only that he might give to the poor, a friend to animals. His heart was concerned only with the happiness of others." End quote. No matter what the truth is, the Count of Saint Germain certainly gained the immortality he always hinted at. He lives on today in legend, occult teachings, and historical mystery, and he continues to inspire countless people toward greater aspirations. In conclusion, the Count of Saint Germain is still alive today. If you enjoyed this investigation, I highly recommend you to watch my video, Enochian, The Lost Language of Angels, for an equally unexplainable mystery and deep character study of one of my favorite people in all of European history, John Dee. Thank you to my patrons for making this extra long video a reality, and if you want to support my next major project, there's a link in the description. All proceeds go back to these videos. I'm Mr. Mythos. You guys are awesome. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.